If they're going to have to do something with it or they're going to start having cases tossed out and that is not good for the administration of justice. Crime lab cutbacks. Police are handing over evidence, but a St. John's lawyer says forensic labs are seriously behind. He, I think, would say, I knew everybody else should have known. A former regiment soldier, but nobody believed him. And finally, his Buren family writes a 60-year-old wrong. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. Let's get to tonight's top story, cutbacks to federal crime labs that are causing delays in our court system. That is the case for a St. John's man suspected of driving drunk and causing a head-on collision. Despite a police blood sample, he still hasn't been charged. <laughs> Here now, Ariana Kelland is live in Ghouls tonight with that CBC investigation. Ariana. Debbie, members of the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary responded here to the Robert E. Howlett Highway in late January. There was a head on collision, and four people, including a child, had to be taken to hospital. The driver of one of these vehicles, his breath smelling like booze and eyes bloodshot, appeared drunk. So police took a blood sample from the 44-year-old and sent it to the RCMP's forensic lab in Ottawa. But it's taken so long to process, the blood evidence is at risk of getting tossed, and the police have gone to a judge to get permission to hold on to it. In court documents, police say due to the closing of three national forensic laboratories within Canada, the time frame for analysis is expected to be beyond 90 days. Those three labs were closed a few years back as a way to save $3.5 million. It was supposed to create a more efficient service. St. John's defense lawyer Bob Simmons sounded an alarm when it was first announced, and he's sounding it now. I can speak from firsthand of someone charged with a serious offense and waiting for these things to come back and the preliminary not being able to go ahead and the council not being able to make all the necessary assessments on the body of evidence against your client is a real problem. And they, they're going to have to do something with it or they're going to start having cases tossed out and that is not good for the administration of justice. The Mounties say they work with investigators to figure out which forensic work gets done based on the urgency or priority of the case. But the length of time it takes depends on the type of analysis that's needed. Routine firearms analysis takes about eight months, but the lab only met its deadline 27% of the time. Toxicology analysis is done in an average of 78 days for routine requests. They meet the expected deadline 68% of the time. Those who rely on the lab the most don't see any systemic issues. At times, for different reasons, there may be delays in, uh, you know, exhibits, say, entering the uh, analysis phase. But uh, for the most part, you know, we're very pleased with the service that we provide. A critical service that will likely be in even more demand as marijuana becomes legalized. As you can imagine, there's hundreds and, and probably thousands of these evaluations that are being done on a yearly basis. So it's a capacity issue for the RCMP lab, crime lab. Uh, my understanding is that they are addressing that uh, capacity issue. And according to RCMP officials, they are, with plans to add staff and expand current facilities. Now, the top prosecutor for Newfoundland and Labrador says she can't think of one case where charges haven't been able to proceed because a delay at the lab, that being the sole reason. As for this impaired driving case, it's been more than four months now and no charges have been laid yet. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Arianna Kelland in St. John's. Police want the public's help to find the man responsible for an armed robbery in Conception Bay South earlier today. The RNC received the call at around noon that a robbery was taking place at a Scotia bank in Long Pond. Police say the man, who did not have his face concealed, entered the bank and demanded cash. He then fled before police arrived. The man is described as about five foot seven with a heavy build and possibly in his 60s. The RNC released these pictures of the suspect. At the time of the robbery, he was wearing blue jeans, a plaid jacket, and a baseball hat. 
A teenager facing three separate sexual assault trials appeared in court today. The Stephenville High student allegedly attacked at least three girls in separate incidents in the fall and winter of 2017. His identity and the identity of the victims are protected under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. Here now's Colleen Connors was at today's trial. The trial got started here this morning at the Stephenville Courthouse involving a male high school student who allegedly attacked three girls on three separate incidences, all off site of the high school they all attend. Now he pleaded not guilty to sexual assault, forcible confinement and using a drug to commit a sexual assault. Now I was sitting next to him in court today and the alleged uh, accuser was sitting quite uh, fidgetly, you know, moving his pen a lot while he was taking some notes, shaking his feet quite a bit. The alleged uh, victim was appearing by a teleconference in another part of the building. She sat very sheepishly with her arms kind of wrapped around herself, speaking very softly as a lawyer, Susan Gallant, asked her some questions. Now, the alleged victim says that uh, he picked her up one night back in the fall. They were out driving around and drinking. They pulled over. He offered her a pill to help relax her. A few minutes after that, she said that she felt quite ill, quite nauseous after taking the pill. They were making out in the back seat and she says that he uh, pulled her very close to him, pulled her on top of him and they had sex without her consent. She told the court that she doesn't remember parts of the non-consensual sex that she passed out. She would pass out on top of him and wake back up and she says that she woke up at one point with no clothes on in the back seat and he was driving her back home. Now, weeks later, the police did approach this woman and asked her questions about another alleged victim and this alleged accuser. She denied everything at first, but four or five days later, she told the court that she told the police the truth that they did have sex without her consent. Now, this afternoon, uh, the accused lawyer, Mark Mills, will cross-examine this alleged victim here in the Stephenville courthouse. And this trial is set to take place over the next several days. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Stephenville. A former Happy Valley Goose Bay bartender who was attacked by Sam Obed says she isn't surprised the man is accused of assaulting someone else. Andrea Party was closing the bar back in 2012 when 47-year-old Obed walked in and ordered a beer. When she refused to serve him, Obed went behind the bar and began punching Party, who bit him and then ran away. He pleaded guilty to the assault and served two years. Obed's now charged with breaking into a woman's home in Halifax and sexually assaulting her. When he moved to Halifax, Party says she tried to warn people that Obed was a risk. I'm not sure. I know that he didn't receive any treatment while he was incarcerated at the time. So, I mean, um, he's, he's, that he was always likely to reoffend. Sorry. Um, that's. I know that there was a lot of things listed when I was in court um, about uh, his previous offenses. Um, I actually got it quite lucky, I think. It just doesn't make any sense to me why the justice system would keep putting him back in public. It doesn't, um, why put public safety at risk over and over? I mean, you know, it, I was the last victim, you know, this shouldn't have happened after the, the second time, the third time, and the fourth time. You know, so, I mean, this is my first time reliving it. Imagine all those other people who have been reliving it, you know, several times later. So it's just, a, I, it's a hard situation. You can't wrap your head around. We're very fortunate here at Memorial University to have a, an exotic swine herd. So these are Yucatan mini pigs. We'll tell you about the new research center that's being built to house them at MUN. Coming up on Here and Now. Many in central Labrador are keeping a close eye on the Churchill River as water levels rise and fall with the spring melt. Yesterday, the town closed off the road to the Birch Island Boardwalk because water had risen to concerning levels. The decision was made to reopen the park after levels subsided. The fire chief says things are safe for now, but they are continuing to watch water levels on the river. We watch for rising water, uh, the monitoring stations, if, if they peak at a higher elevation than they were last year, that sort of thing. So we're working, our town engineers working with the Department of the Environment uh, representatives. So he gets notifications from them and then we take precautions. 
Do you think it might have been anything to do with the, the runoff? I mean, they had For a fair sure. amount of snow. They had a lot this. of snow this yeah. winter. Uh, interesting to note, though, uh, precipitation has actually been below average over the last couple of months, hmm. uh, month after month, really since, since April. So, uh, yeah, some rise and fall there as uh, Mother Nature tries to, uh, you know, suss things out with all that yeah. uh, snow melting. So. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful day. It was gorgeous. Sunny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. across uh, uh, Labrador especially. This was the scene in uh, beautiful Forto, and the Forto Bay webcam uh, is uh, always one that I like to check out, and you can see uh, where it was a beautiful day there. Now, a little on the cool side, you can still see some snow on the, on the hills there, uh, around 6, 7 degrees in the Strait of Labrador today, recovering quite nicely today to the double digits and teens across most of Newfoundland after the uh, snow that we can all blame Carolyn Stokes for because uh, she was in yesterday, not me. Uh, I mean, right? Uh, now, as we take a look at the future tracker, we do have some cooler temperatures as we're into the double digits today. It's back to the single digits tomorrow and some wet weather on the way. Periods of rain primarily overnight and into the early morning hours of Wednesday. Still some periods of rain lingering through the morning, uh, even into the afternoon along the northeast coast. But I think it's more of a drizzle setup for St. John's closer to the low. And on the west coast, we'll actually see some clearing into the afternoon. Area of high pressure moving in as we roll into the Thursday time period. So it's really one day of this uh, a wet weather maker, but uh, certainly with the northerly winds, temps are going to be cool too. We'll break down your full forecast details coming up in just a few minutes. Anthony. Thanks, Ryan. A local app developer is getting a boost from one of the world's most recognized voices. Susan Bennett is the original voice of Siri, Apple's virtual assistant, who no doubt you've heard. And now she's teamed up with a woman from this province to help people stop smoking. Here now, Zach Gowdy explains. Hazel Harrison knows firsthand how hard it is to quit smoking. I tried everything on the market, the patch, the medications, um, and nothing worked for me. So this one morning I woke up and I said, okay, very, very determined to quit. So I was going to have one cigarette every hour, and then the next day every hour and 15 minutes, and I gradually weaned myself down. Now Harrison has turned her quitting strategy into an app. It's called Quit My Way. You enter in the number of cigarettes you're smoking per day, the hours you're awake per day, and it sets up a customized algorithm for you. And so what it does, it just, it notifies you throughout the day, each time when it's time for you to smoke. So say you started off with 20, 20 cigarettes a day, it'll notify you 20 times the, the first day, and then the second day it might notify you 19 times and 18, and until you get down to one. So if you're smoking about 20, it'll take you about four weeks to get down to one cigarette. It's an example of what psychologists call a commitment device, a way to lock yourself into a plan you may otherwise have trouble sticking to. But commitment devices only work if people commit to them. So Harrison enlisted help from a celebrity. How can I help you? Siri is Apple's virtual assistant. If you've ever used an iPhone, you've probably had a conversation with her. But many people don't realize that Siri's voice comes from a real person. Hello, I'm Susan Bennett, singer, voice actor, and the original voice of Siri. Uh, it's not that I don't trust you, but can you give us a, a little taste of the Siri? In a quarter of a mile, make a left turn. <laughs> and you're gone, right? You're turning left. Bennett, as Siri, provides the narration for Quit My Ways tutorial video. Uploading a few photos of your loved ones is recommended. Bottom of this page is the exact date you'll be down to one cigarette per day. For Bennett, being involved in the app was personal. She, too, is a former smoker. So I was very happy to be a part of something that was going to help other people. That's one of the things that I'm hoping to do more of as the original voice of Siri, and that is to, uh, to be able to, you know, appeal to people, help them in some way or other. Bennett knows the power of her own voice. People trust in what's familiar, and trust is important when it comes to things we don't want to hear, like someone telling you not to smoke. People speak to Siri and Alexa and all these different uh, virtual assistants so much on a daily basis, and they do take instructions from these virtual assistants' voices, and so I can only think that it would have a very, uh, you know, comforting and familiar and uh, a kind of a call to action um, uh, effect on, on people who are hearing it. I mean, I hope so. Um, Siri, uh, is it time for me to go have a cigarette? I would have to say, Zach, that you need to just forget about cigarettes entirely. 
As always, Siri gives good advice. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Well, if a provincial election were held today, the PCs would come out on top. That's according to a new poll just released by Corporate Research Associates. And the PC leader, Chess Crosby, has more support than Premier Dwight Ball, 34 percent to 27. NDP leader Jerry Rogers has 19 percent. The poll says preference for the Tories comes from declining support for the governing, governing Liberal Party over the last six months. Three in ten residents are undecided. Of the decided voters, 42 percent support the PCs, 36 percent support the Liberals, and 22 back the NDP. CRA did the telephone poll of 800 adults in the province. Overall results are accurate to within plus or minus 3.5 percentage points 95 times out of 100. Now, Premier Ball responded to the poll today during a news conference in central Newfoundland. When this poll was conducted early May, right after the BC leadership, which is typically you always get a bump in the polls coming off a leadership review. This is what we've seen with the PC party. And added to that is one of the most challenging times that we've seen as a Liberal Party as we've had, uh, we've dealt with issues that are primarily been internalized in the past. But we've, we've made a decision that it's certainly uh, discussions that we need to have to be able to be more transparent. On the heels of the poll and ahead of the leadership uh, review of the Liberal leader in two weeks, the president of the Liberal Party sent an email to members today. John Allen wrote that the, part will, the party will be stronger than ever in 2019 and that people will see the resilience of this party under the leadership of Dwight Ball. Ball's popularity has been consistently dropping. What is driving the drop in popularity? We'll put those questions to the CRA pollster in about a half an hour on Here and Now. A lawyer at the Public Utility Board Automobile Insurance Review is raising questions about the purpose of the hearings. Jerome Kennedy is with a group of lawyers arguing against a proposed cap of minor injury claims in this province. He says he was surprised to hear PUB Chair Darlene Whalen say the board will not make a recommendation to the provincial government regarding a claims cap. What they're doing here is now a, a, an investigative review. And with the review, and of course all the time and effort that's going to be spent on this, then the logical uh, next step is that they would make recommendations as to which way to proceed. So I, I have to say I'm a, I'm a little confused as to uh, the, the comment of the, the chair today, but that's something we will explore as we move through this and hopefully uh, be able to resolve exactly what it is that we're doing here. It began as a case of mistaken identity, and now a son's quest to have his father's wartime service officially recognized has been laid to rest here in St. Lawrence.
St. John's Eye Doctor is warning that things could get a lot worse for those needing cataract surgery in the province. Dr. Christopher Jackman says wait times will increase dramatically if the province bans private clinics from providing cataract surgery. Jackman says private clinics like the one he operates should be allowed to perform the surgeries and bill the cost to MCP. He says some patients are waiting as long as two years to have their surgeries and others are flying out of province to have the procedure. We currently have a fully functioning state-of-the-art operating room built specifically to do cataract and other eye lens surgeries. Government plans to prohibit the people of Newfoundland and Labrador from accessing this type of facility. We could provide publicly funded outside of hospital tomorrow, as is done in other provinces, which would help eliminate wait lists. Two sites have been picked to house long-term care sites in central Newfoundland. One will be built near the CNA campus in Gander, the other on Scott Avenue in Grand Falls, Windsor. Government officials spent the day touring central Newfoundland, making the announcements. While the new centres will focus on care for an ageing population, government says it will also free up emergency waiting rooms. But the problems with the acute sector, the fix for those, will come by looking into long-term care because a lot of the problems in the acute sector with wait times are people are there because they can't get in to places where they can get the care they need. Places like Botwood and the Hugh Toomey Centre. The Hawes family in St. Lawrence marked an emotional anniversary on Friday. On that day, 100 years ago, Joseph Hawes, a shy, illiterate 17-year-old boy, enlisted in the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. And it was a decision that would shape his life and later bring tremendous heartache to his 13 children. We were first introduced to one of his sons, Donald Hawes, in the fall. And he told us about his lifelong battle to have his father's service officially recognized. Despite his service, the name Joseph Hawes didn't exist in the war records. And it was all because of several small spelling mistakes that had big consequences. Besides not being able to read and write, Joseph Hawes had a relatively thick Bay accent, so when he enlisted and told officials his name, they recorded it incorrectly. Hawes became Halls. His hometown of Lewins Cove was recorded as Lewis Cove. On top of that, he lied about his age, so his date of birth was also incorrect. Despite serving for more than a year overseas, the name Joseph Hawes of Lewins Cove simply did not exist and access to the proof was off limits because of privacy laws. When those laws changed, Larry Dowie at the rooms helped Donald Hawes make that wrong right. The proof was uncovered and the official war records have been amended, but for Donald Hawes, there was still one important thing left to do. Here now's Carolyn Stokes has more. A son's lifelong quest to have his father's service with the Royal Newfoundland Regiment officially recognized is finally getting some closure here at a ceremony in St. Lawrence. Generations of Hawes family members from across the country traveled to this little town on the Buren Peninsula for one reason. Provide to Joseph Hawes in death that which he could not have in life, that which is bestowed on all World War I veterans honor. Donald Hawes has fought for his father's honor since he was 11 years old. He wrote letter after letter trying to get records and information. He even wrote to the Queen for help and received a response. But it was never enough to prove that Joseph Hawes existed. Letter after letter came back rejected. We could not prove that the file belonged to Joseph Hawes and we were denied all access because allowing us access could have potentially violated the rights of Joseph Halls or the privacy rights of Joseph Halls, H-A-L-L-S. Now, in Joseph's file, there were several misspellings of his name in the file as a child, I would witness my father, Joseph, resting his head 
on his hand and staring into space. What was he seeing? We were too young to understand. We went days without food. We were starving. PTSD had reared its ugly head. A family living in abject poverty, with no means of escape. Uneducated, untrained, and unwanted, Joseph Hawes did not exist. Nobody, nobody survives war unscathed. Nobody. Joseph Haas may not have received recognition in life, but his son hopes changing the gravestone will help him rest in peace. We've had added the caribou, the emblem of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, and this regimental number. And this one was provided by the last post fund. And it identifies him as a private in the Royal Newfoundland Regiment with the words, lest we forget and we will never forget. One final act to honor his father and finally bring closure to himself. So that any and all who visit here will know that herein rests a fallen soldier. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. Lawrence. Nice story. Memorial University is building a $36 million facility on its St. John's, on its St. John's campus, rather, near the Health Sciences Centre. The new Animal Resource Centre will be used for teaching and research and is going to house some rather surprising creatures. Mark Quinn has more. Munn's Director of Animal Care Services says the university is very fortunate to have an exotic swine herd. They're Yucatan mini pigs and are very, very useful for uh, human disease modeling. Useful for research because you may or may not be surprised to learn that people are a lot like pigs. So the swine heart, for example, closely mirrors uh, that of the, the human heart. Also the whole digestive tract and digestive system. Along with mice and rats, this new facility will also be home to some of these animals, groundhogs, also known as woodchucks. Woodchucks are a very good model for hepatitis, hepatitis virus. And so the progression of the disease in woodchucks really closely mirrors that in humans. The current animal research building is almost five decades old. So the university is constructing this new building to continue to get certification from the Canadian Council on Animal Care. Memorial does hold a certificate of good animal practice, which is the seal of approval from the CCAC. But they have identified that our facilities are beyond, uh, no, no longer meet this, the standards, so that was the, the need for this new building. Construction is scheduled to be done by late 2019, and the new centre is expected to be fully operational by 2020. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Eight day, pretty well, we're getting a new person. A lot of them are younger people, some of them are older people that never avail of food banks before. Demand is growing at two food banks in Mount Pearl, and they're fearing the demand will continue to grow.
Welcome back to here now, everyone. Quick look at your weather forecast. Uh, again, uh, it's that time of year. A couple steps forward, a couple steps back, and we will be taking a step backward, at least across the island for tomorrow, where we were talking about uh, even this evening into the double digits and teens, but winds are shifting, and uh, those uh, southerly winds for St. John's, St. Lawrence, uh, and Bonavista are going to be back northerly again tomorrow, and that means a cool down. Here's the system that's moving in as we speak. And it's been tracking in th through the day. It's been a soggy day across the Maritimes, and that is a preview of what's to come for us. It's over the Southern Avalon now and into the St. John's Metro region over the next couple of hours uh, with that rain coming down at a pretty good clip through the overnight tonight and in through the early morning hours of tomorrow. Uh, the yellows and even oranges. Those are the heavier periods of rain, which for the most part will be done by 6 a.m. tomorrow and will have moved off to the northeast. Still, though, some lingering showers at times steady for the drive to work tomorrow. There's 6 a.m. Basically, the eastern half of the island, Grand Falls, Windsor to Port of Basque included, uh, will be looking at a chance of seeing some showers tomorrow morning. Drive from Cornerbrook up through the Straits, uh, St. Anthony, and we are going to be looking at some snow on the way for Nain, Makovic, Hopedale, a couple centimeters of accumulation as a, a system spins out in the Labrador Sea and wraps some moisture in for you folks. Now, as we roll into the afternoon, periods of rain will linger a little bit longer, I think, for the northeast coast, closer to the low across the Avalon, likely just some drizzle, but far from a pleasant day. Winds are from the north, right and off the water, and that will mean drizzle will linger, fog patches, and it is going to be likely around four or five degrees for most of us get your way inland and we're talking about six seven maybe eight degrees uh, should get to eight degrees along the south coast tomorrow again clearing a little bit earlier for the southwest coast the west coast of the island uh, slight risk of a shower early early on uh, but we are talking about generally uh, looking at uh, some sunshine into the afternoon and improving conditions as we rebound into the double digit range pretty quiet through southeastern labrador tomorrow but that snow from nain down through Hopedale to Makovic, and those northwest winds will be uh, cool for certain. Now, as we take a look into the long range, we are watching that system depart. Thursday, not looking like a bad day, although we are watching a system just off to the southeast, which will at least throw a bit of cloud cover into the mix. Not ruling out a couple of spits of showers here and there across the Avalon, but primarily it's going to be a dry day. Uh, at, at least at this point, we are looking at uh, 12 to as warm as 14 degrees for central towards western Newfoundland and in the Labrador, but we will see some showers moving in to western Labrador, and that will continue to track in for Friday uh, into Happy Valley Goose Bay by Friday afternoon and approaching, but I don't think quite making it until Friday evening for Port of Basque and Cornerbrook. You can see rebounding quite nicely across central Newfoundland and even the east for Friday. Your weekend details are still ahead. Debbie? Thanks, Ryan. Mount Pearl's two food banks are busier than ever. 90 new families have signed up to receive support in recent months. And as you'll hear from the volunteers, that need doesn't seem to be slowing down. Basically the concept of a food hamper is four, five, six days food, right? There's bread, butter, sugar, tea bags, French fries, this kind of product, flakes of ham, turkey, pasta, that kind of, uh, that kind of product. We've had at least a 30% rise in uh, families coming to uh, receive food and that for, the, for the first time. We are open here at this food bank uh, from 7 to 7.30 in the evening, Monday to Thursday. And Bob and they're open in the daytime and whatnot. But uh, like I say, we've noticed a lot of people coming home from away for the very first time and got to come and avail of the food bank. Uh, the seniors especially, uh, they're... I mean, it's, it's a sin the way, when they, when they come in here, I mean, we speak to them. Uh, a lot of them that come in, I mean, we speak to them on a personal basis and whatnot. We're averaging about 120 a month now for the first four months of the year. The statistics are not available for May month yet, but compared to last year, I think we served something like 75 more families in the first four months of the year. And every day, pretty well, we're getting a new person. A lot of them are younger people, some of them are older people that never availed of food banks before. But we're talking about light bills and stuff. Most people used as a proof of address we require. Some of them use their uh, light bill as their proof of address. And I've noticed uh, there's a substantial outstanding balance on some of these bills, and, I, and they, don't, they haven't yet felt the impact of the increase in light bills yet. So that's going to be another hit for them, you know? Right. And that's only going to be another hit for us at the food banks. And unfortunately, we only got so much money 
and the people are supporting us are all they're all going to get a hit with a light increased light bill too so they might have to mm-hmm. curtail their donations by five or ten dollars a month and what do you do then and when you look at it especially with me and bob like i say we split mount pearl in half bob does one half mount pearl and we do the other it may not seem like a lot but i mean mount pearl is still uh, 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 say a small community now those volunteers say their biggest donations come at Christmas time, in particular from the local hockey association. And they're always looking for donations, especially money, so they can buy a, a wide variety of items. We're not going to back down to the challenges that we had to face as a province and as a Liberal Party and our team. Premier Dwight Ball responding to the latest poll results. They show his party and his own support dropping. The PCs are now the party with the most support in this province. We'll talk to a pollster about that next. The Progressive Conservatives are the most preferred political party in this province among decided voters, edging out the governing Liberals. That's according to a CRA poll released today. Abacus Data recently released their poll, which also shows a similar lead. Well, to break down today's poll, we're joined by Don Mills of Corporate Research Associates. Thanks very much for joining us, Don. Well, let's start with the parties. When it comes to the parties, how are decided voters feeling? Well, there's actually been a flip in the last three months. Uh, they've exchanged places with the with the uh, the result being that the PCs are now uh, have the most uh, voter support uh, in the province. This is actually the first time in more than a year that the PCs have led the uh, the Liberals. So. Um, there's ob obviously something that's changed in the last three months. Are you seeing a trend with this decline in the Liberal support? Well, they had peaked uh, uh, about six months ago in terms of support. When it looked like they were starting to re regain some support after their uh, harsh budget of a couple of years ago, as you recall. Um, uh, but uh, obviously there's been a couple of things that have happened over the last uh, three uh, months that have changed their fortunes. Now, obviously one of them it has to do with the harassment uh, scandal uh, that affected their government, led to the uh, ouster of a couple of ministers. And, and uh, I think also the election uh, of uh, Chess uh, Crosby as the new PC leader has uh, certainly uh, helped the uh, PCs uh, standing in this latest poll. 
Now, the Premier acknowledged as much today that mm. uh, these two things have hurt the party. Is there anything else fueling the decline, do you think? Well, uh, the government has spent uh, the better part of the last two years with the majority of the population uh, dissatisfied with its performance. And I think the accumulated impact of that dissatisfaction may be starting to take a greater hold. Um, I, I think it's uh, uh, probably an indication that people are starting to look at alternatives now, uh, given uh, you know, some of the troubles that uh, the province has faced over the last couple of years, especially the uh, fiscal problems of the province. So uh, it's probably not too surprising that their support is uh, a little uh, weakened, uh, given the long uh, period of dissatisfaction with the performance of the government by the majority of people in the province. Now, Don, how are decided voters ranking the party leaders? Well, on that score, uh, the benefit uh, does uh, go uh, towards the P new PC leader, and of course, he is brand new. Uh, not m many people would know him that well, I wouldn't think. Um, and so he he's preferred now uh, over Premier Ball as the as the best individual to be Premier of the province. So. Uh, at least in the short term, the advantage goes to the PCs. Now, uh, Premier Ball has a leadership review coming up uh, shortly. Should that concern him? Hard to know. Uh, you know, there's been some turmoil, uh, as you know, starting with Kathy Bennett uh, in, the, in their cabinet. Uh, the ouster of two ministers certainly hasn't made it uh, easy for the Premier. Uh, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. I also noticed in your poll, Don, that 29% of voters say they are undecided. It's up slightly from the last poll three months ago. How do you interpret that? Yeah, that's pretty standard for uh, you know a period in between elections. Usually, that number goes down the closer uh, an election comes. We're you know we're quite uh, some time away from the next election, so it's very uh, normal to have that level of undecided. You know, there are some people who clearly are not paying attention to what's going on uh, at the government level at the moment. And just finally, you said uh, the general election, it's less than a year and a half away, which doesn't seem like a lot of time, but I guess sometimes a week is a long time in politics. Well, it sure is, and that uh, year and a half is going to go by very quickly. There's still plenty of challenges in, in the province. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be very interesting, and uh, I wouldn't uh, discount uh, the NDP, who uh, have a, a pretty strong following in the... Uh, in the province as well. So it's really a three-party uh, competition in Newfoundland and Labrador, and that's what makes it uh, more interesting when there's three, three parties that are competing for government. Don Mills will leave it there and talk again. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Debbie. Have a great day. Shifting now to some national news, the tour bus crash in eastern Ontario yesterday claimed the life of one of the passengers on board. Police say the passenger was a 50-year-old Chinese man. There were 37 people on the bus when the accident happened yesterday afternoon. And that included the American driver and tour guide, along with a group of Chinese tourists. The bus crashed on Highway 401 and hit a rock wall. Five passengers are still in hospital in serious condition. An inquiry has begun in Ontario to examine the case of long-term care nurse Elizabeth Wetlofer. She confessed to killing eight of her patients. No suggestion that these offences will be repeated in Ontario, but there's also no guarantee that they will not. What is most troubling to many of us is that were it not for the confessions of Wetlofer, no one would have suspected any type of foul play at all. Wetlofer is now serving eight life sentences. She is considered one of Canada's worst serial killers. The judge heading the inquiry says it will be focused on re-establishing trust in a system that failed.
Let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is Joey Windsor, seven years old from CBS. Joey's involved in hockey and has been playing for four years. Mm -hmm. Cool haircut too. He's playing his first year of novice with the CBR Renegades. He loves the sport and he's always trying to improve. Way to go, Joey. Congrats on being today's young athlete of the day. So we're going to look long range now. That's right. <laughs> we uh, live in hope. <laughs> can't get any worse uh, than the last week. Oh, yes, week. it can. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Never say that in Newfoundland and Labrador. I should know this after 10 years. Uh, have a look at current temperatures. Uh, it was uh, a cool one for sure across the Maritimes today. Note those winds in from the northeast, and you can see where it was uh, just 7 degrees right now in Halifax, 8 in Greenwood, 7 in Charlottetown, 4 in Sydney. And that is the north cool wind wrapping in around the other side of this system with the showers on the go. And we are talking about that rain, that same system moving in as we speak with uh, rain on the go primarily through the overnight hours tonight into the morning hours tomorrow tapers off to more drizzle and shower activity and even into the afternoon still certainly some lingering showers, but I think it's primarily the northeast coast that we'll see that uh, based on the current track of that system moves off to the north. Thursday, certainly some improvements across a good portion of the island. Area of high pressure and control. A weak system passing just to the south may throw a few showers into the mix for the Avalon. And then we're watching this system, which is going to be our weekend weather maker. Unfortunately, uh, you want our, your weekend weather maker to be an area of high pressure. Uh, this will be the low that's going to be tracking in Friday afternoon. I think uh, maybe this model is a bit early, but certainly the potential that some of those showers are into the mix uh, by uh, 3, 4 p.m., Definitely by evening and then is by the time we get to Friday night, Saturday morning, everybody into the mix, not ruling out some wet snow again in the mix for Happy Valley Goose Bay and parts of Labrador with this system into Sunday morning. We move off into the Sunday evening time period and that system will clear allow allowing for at least the potential for some Sunday afternoon sunshine, which is certainly the brightest looking point of the weekend across Newfoundland. Chances some showers moving in uh, back again for later Monday into the southeast primarily, but not ruling it out uh, for central or uh, or western parts of Newfoundland either. So certainly um, an active seven day is the best way to put this. Uh, temperatures, yeah, riding the normal mark uh, certainly for the Thursday Friday time period, but tapering off a little bit cooler than average as we roll into the early stages of next week and into Labrador. We were talking about temperatures again, not too bad Thursday, Friday, but a cooler trend into the early stages of next week for you folks as well. That's your forecast to now. Viewer picture is still to come. All right, then it's safe to come. Whoa, whoa, we got lane number two. So you've checked lane number one. So now let's look for lane number two. Is there anything coming to the left? No. Anything to the right? No. Anything to the left? No. Okay, let's try lane three. Lane three is right here. Well, earlier this afternoon, the RNC rolled out a crosswalk at Mary Queen of Peace School on Torbay Road. It was all about showing the right way and, of course, the wrong way to cross the street. It seems like a simple thing to be able to do, Anthony, mm -hmm. but... You know, with our bad weather, Not thanks, to mention Ryan. <laughs> certain drivers. <laughs> yes, it's it's good to um, safety first. Think mm -hmm. about it. Absolutely. So, Pride Week festivities in Springdale are underway after last night's flag raising at the town hall. I had to have the GSA uh, committee group here with us and the citizens of Springdale to declare this Pride Week. We raise the flag on behalf. Thank you very much for attending. We brought you this scene last night as the mayor and high school students raised the flag at that opening ceremony. The town has been uh, in the center of a controversy when the council rejected a proposal to paint a rainbow crosswalk. Despite the criticism, high school students and council worked together to come up with plans for Pride Week. The students with the Gender Sexuality Alliance say the whole process was worth it. I wouldn't have changed anything. Uh, it was really amazing how we got to have that opportunity to speak up and speak in front of the town council. Well, when you believe in something and you know it's important to you, it's important to keep fighting for it. Well, now there's controversy and confusion over those rainbow crosswalks in New Brunswick. The city of Moncton plans to paint over its rainbow crosswalks. New Brunswick's Department of Transportation says they aren't up to regulation and a committee rule on whether or not they're safe. 
Adding to the confusion, New Brunswick's premier took to Twitter to say he's encouraging more towns to install them to support the LGBTQ community. All right, so tonight's viewer picture isn't name that location, it's name that cloud. It's a uh, rainbow interrupted <laughs> by a lot of cloud. Basically, a rainbow cloud is the uh, uh, easiest way to put this, but there is a cloud name, so any of you uh, is that a weenies out there. Is that a sympathy card? <laughs> So it's almost time to say it good is. night, but first have a look at the spectacular video. Check this out. This iceberg, we actually had a still of this last night, I think, thanks to our pictures. That and was uh, Upper oh, Amherst that's Cove near right. Bonavista. Vista. And now, obviously, some fantastic uh, drone footage taken by uh, Eric Abbott. I mean, look at that. That is spectacular. There's an, uh, there's an above shot coming up in a moment, you can see how it has split in half. Our director would like to kayak through that, he says. Yes. Yep. But <laughs> we're not, not going to let him. That's right, yeah. <laughs> we're not going to let him. He's not well. But, uh, <laughs> that's, that is absolutely stunning. Yeah. The stuff that they create with these drones. It really has opened up a whole wow. new way of seeing these yeah. spectacular sights around our province. And cheaper than a helicopter. <laughs> I love the contrast between the blues and the greens and the motion of the water. Spectacular. It's very calming after a one hour television show. We should do this every night. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like therapy. Look at that. Oh, so wow. beautiful. Mm -hmm. now, speaking of calming, right. uh, you showed us a picture just before the break. Uh, let's have a look and tell us about it. Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, you would just call it a rainbow cloud, which is what uh, some people refer to it as. It's the uh, Springdale cloud. It's, look at the colors. <laughs> They're all there. It definitely goes with the theme of uh, the last block of the show, uh, talking about uh, those uh, crosswalks. And um, a beautiful shot. Often you see this with the uh, cirrus clouds or, uh, you know, those high level clouds you can see there in the highest of the atmosphere. This was actually a couple uh, folks that uh, did see this in snap pictures. Mm -hmm. This one was from Goobies and it is a uh, cloud iridescence, I believe is how you say that. Iridescence. Iridescence. Yeah. yeah. It is nice and sparkly. Did you say these are serious clouds? 
Cirrus. They look like happy C clouds. Cirrus, <laughs> Cirrus clouds are serious clouds, Anthony, because they're the leading edge of uh, weather disturbances ah, tracking in. Wow. That's really nice. You know, I've never, ever seen that. I've seen, obviously, rainbows. I've seen double rainbows. I've never seen this. Well, there you go. Icebergs, rainbows. <laughs> Thanks so much, Don, for sending that in. All we need is in. unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow, we live in hope. Oh, we have the wrong name, we're told. Oh, this iceberg is from Trinity Eco Tours. Or oh, we're sorry about uh, But we're grateful you sent it in. Absolutely. You gotta make sure we give uh, praise where praise is due. Yeah. Nice way nice way to end the show. Thank you very much for being with us everyone. Have a great night. See you back here tomorrow. <laughs>